tunakuabudu tunakuabudu mokozi yesu tunakuabudu tunakuabudu mokozi yesu tunakuabudu
Sihati ya tuwa tano ni boni seme Atuwa ibo ya nasema ni wewe Sikuwa ujanja wangu Sikuwa ujuzi wangu Nikuwa ngugu zako ni mefika Hapa Sitaji ya tuwa tano ni boni seme Atuwa ibo ya nasema ni wewe Janja wangu, ni kwa ujuzi wangu, ni kwa nguvu za kodi mefika Jema hata sasa we, 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 ulipo fika, ulipo fika, we, we, ni ebende Hata sasa we, 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 ni ebende, ebeneza, ebeneza, bebe Kuinu 
Sapphires, but next as a few. So we are the sapphires, and we have our frame. We have our frame. Kindly, committee, can you just stand so that they can read our frame? Uh huh. What do you read? What do you read? Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, elders, I hope Mona our WhatsApp group, right? Ah, fungua, fungua data, fungua data, fungua data, fungua data, fungua data. Wasimame waone kwanza alafu waketi si ndio? Oh elders oh mimi ndio sijafungua. Ah! Wanaambia sijafungua ba. Yeah so elders kindly stand up. Wa waone hao watu then tukae chini. Elders tusimame. Kama umekaa kando ya elder nataki kusimama. Mwambie asimame bana. Kuna wengine walijifanya kwamba ni elders hapa. Tumewaona, tumewaona. Job, tumewaona kuna wengine walijifanya kwamba ni elders. Kama si elder usisimame. Aha. So kila mtu ameona kwa groups ndio? Wonderful? Right? Ah sasa mnaweza kaa. So I want us to recite our slogan. I want us to recite our slogan, right? And then we shall be gone. The full meaning of the abbreviation CBRSM. Sure. CBRSM in full means consistent Bible reading and scripture meditation. Wow, it's so inspiring. Please, can you expound on it? Sure, as it is, Consistent Bible reading and scripture meditation is a program that nurtures individual to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation without getting bored and meditation as well. Hey, so you mean that one can read the entire Bible from one book to another through every chapter? This sounds like a mystery to me because I've never thought that someone could read through the entire Bible. Well, I myself tried it, but the stories in the book of Leviticus were not adding up to me. 
I understand your case when it comes to that, actually. Personally, I've read the entire Bible, and currently I'm in my third time. Uh, as I started reading my Bible, I was in my first year. And you know, when I read through Leviticus, I first went to the New Testament. I was just bored with the stories in Leviticus. And what was your motivating factor? You know, while I was in my second year, I was introduced to CBRSM by my friend Kihugwa. And uh, through the accountability partner that was assigned, what? Well, it was tough. I managed to consistently read my Bible. And when I read through Leviticus, uh, I tried to understand the mystery behind it because I thought the Bible would have not recorded such an information that couldn't benefit us today. And uh, for sure, Leviticus is my best book in the Bible. Wow, that is awesome. So you mean you got to overcome the consistency barriers and now you've got to a position of understanding the flow of the word. Now, what are the benefits of CBRSM? As you know, we find it easy reading the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. There are some concepts you miss in the New Testament or misinterpret the scripture. Another thing, it helps us to pray the word with understanding. You know, there are some challenges that arise in life. And the Bible tells us there is nothing new under the world. So it will help us to biblically approach and deal with these life issues. And maybe to add on something that she has not mentioned, that it helps us to detect the hierarchies that arise, that we may be able to know the truth and not to be conformed with the patterns of this world. Wow, it's been so amazing that I've been inspired to attend CBRSM. If I may ask, guys, where, do you have, where and when do you have your classes? We usually meet the first Sunday of every month at NS4, immediately after the first service. Come a leo apa, immediately after the service, let's proceed to NS4, and we will welcome all of you. It's been a pleasure hosting you guys. I have learned a lot, and I believe that the audience has also got something. Welcome so much, guys, to the CBRSM classes, which shall begin immediately after the first service at NS4. Don't, Don't miss. miss. Praising. Atawale, atawale tu mochi ye yesu, atawale. Atawale, atawale tu mochi ye yesu, atawale.
Jesus. I praise Jesus, L4. L5, praise Jesus. Yeah. It is another fine morning that we thank Jesus Christ. As you've heard, our first ministration song says that let him reign. Let him reign inside our lives. Inside our academics, let him reign. Then our second ministration songs, a song, it is just speaking about uh, us backing unto the way of the Christ for, for the ways uh, he is working upon us through his self, through assisting us to come back unto salvation. Praise Jesus. So sit back, relax, and enjoy as we minister unto you. Thanks. Thank you. It's 
something to God. Tell God that what you want to, that he may speak to your heart. Just tell God to speak to you even as we, as we wait to hear from him. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, King of Glory. We are grateful because of your goodness, because of your faithfulness, because God, you've gathered us, hear us, oh God, to worship you, to praise you, and even to listen from you, oh God. I will pray, Father, that even as you are going to listen from your word, that you shall speak to our hearts, oh God. You shall meet with us at our point of needs, oh God. Thank you, Father, because of the speaker, oh Lord. We pray that, Lord, you may use him, oh God, to speak that which you want to speak to us, oh God. Anoint him, O King of glory, and use him as a vessel of honor. For this we pray in Jesus' name. And now, as we welcome our speaker, he will come, he will introduce himself, he'll tell us much more about himself. Let us appreciate him as he comes. Continue appreciating him until he reaches here. Praise the Lord. Bonesa Sifue. Hey, you guys are many. Uh, okay, so my name is uh, Amos Nyongesa, and I'm born again. I love the Lord so much. Um, I'm married to one wife, and uh, God has blessed us with uh, two beautiful girls. Uh, uh, apparently, my wife and I, we are alumni of this university and also of this Christian Union. Uh, yes. Uh, I left here in uh, 2011. Where were you? Yeah, I left here in 2011 and uh, my wife left here in 2013. Uh, we've been married for the last uh, seven years, and uh, we, we thank God uh, thus far. Uh, 
I serve at uh, Sirikwa Pentecostal Fellowship. I'm uh, the lead pastor at Sirikwa Pentecostal Fellowship Central. I think uh, most of you who have been coming for Focus Prayer Breakfast might have seen me there. So that's where I serve uh, the Lord. And uh, I think I'm in full-time ministry, courtesy of this Christian Union. So uh, don't take it for granted uh, when you fellowship here. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. My prayer is that we will all be ministered to and God will speak to each one of us in a special way. Uh, I was asked to speak on try me on this, try me on this. And I tend to think that this comes from Malachi. Malachi, and I think most of us, we are so familiar with Malachi 3.10. Uh, the New King James Version is the one that has that phrase, uh, try me on this. Uh, but in the NLT, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in the temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows. I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. And then he says, try it, put me to the test. Try it, put me to the test. So this is God speaking to the Israelites. Uh, I know our topic uh, tends towards giving and uh, more especially on tithing. So allow me to read a scripture from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 to 29. This is what Moses writes. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God, at the place he will choose as a dwelling, as a dwelling for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant and you have been uh, blessed by, by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is far away, is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you, you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, and, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have, an, they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year and produce, and produ of that year's produce and store in it in your towns, so that the Levites who have no allotment or inheritance of their own and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We give glory to you. You are a good God. You are a loving Father. This morning, Lord, we gather in your presence to worship you and also to listen to your word. And we pray that Lord Jesus will speak to each one of us and minister to us as uh, you desire, O oh God. We pray that your word will build us and more so lead us to grow into the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and help us to be devoted to you in worship. We thank you, Lord, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, our topic today tends towards giving and uh, tithing uh, in particular, especially that scripture that was read to us. But today, uh, in the days that we are living in, giving and tithing, and especially to the church, is something that is so uh, of interest to people 
more especially, not because it's bad, but because of how it has been abused, and especially by us, the church. And uh, we have so many questions about giving and tithing, generally. Uh, the other day, it was, uh, it was somehow like trending in social med media, and people were saying, uh, why should we be giving 10% uh, of our income to the church? Why should we be giving? And people are asking questions about it. But yes, it's okay to ask questions, but we as believers, the question that we should ask ourselves is, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And so there are so many questions about it. And I don't think I'll be able to answer all the questions, but I hope as we look at this topic, we will see what the Bible really says about uh, giving. I think one of the uh, questions that is mostly asked by Christians, and I see it, people discussing it a lot, is that, especially on tithing, that tithing was an Old Testament practice of the law. And today, uh, for the New Testament Christian, you are not required to tithe. Uh, I think that question is, is not an easy yes and no uh, answer uh, to that question. But I think if we allow God to speak to us what he has said in his word, it will help us to make a conclusion concerning giving and tithing. Now, there's a book by a French scholar, a Christian, called Jacques Ellul. And this book, the title is Subversion of Christianity. Literally, that's a negative title, that Christianity has been subverted. And who has subverted Christianity? And uh, in it, he quotes uh, a famous Danish theologian, theologian called Kierkegaard Solen. And this is what he says. The Christendom is an effort of the human race to go back to walking on all fours. That we who are in Christianity today, we are working so hard to walk on all fours. We human beings, we walk on our two feet. But we are working so hard to go back and walk on four uh, legs. And he says, we are working so hard to get rid of Christianity, claiming that it is Christianity perfected. So we were working so hard to get rid of Christianity as presented in the Bible, and in it, put in a Christianity that we claim it is perfected. This is what he says. The Christianity of Christendom takes away from Christianity the offense, and we know the offense, Paul says, the offense of the cross, the paradox. And instead of that, introduces probability. We know what probability means. The plainly comprehensible. So we take away what is presented to us, and in it, we introduce probability. And I think that's what we are doing today with marriage, with gender, we are introducing probability that you can really not really know who you are. You need somebody else to define it for you. That is, it transforms Christianity into something entirely different from what it is in the New Testament into exactly the opposite. This is, this is the Christianity of Christendom, of us men. In the Christianity of Christendom, the cross has become something like a child's hobby, horse, and trumpet. Then he asked this question. How has it come about that the development of Christianity and the church has given birth to a society, a civilization, a culture, that are completely opposite to what we read in the Bible? To what it is in this Putably, the text of the law, the prophets, Jesus, and Paul. 
how has it come that we have a Christianity that is so different than the one that is presented to us in the Bible? And I think I agree with him. Look at the way we Christians and the church are handling some of the issues that we have around us. And some of the things that are so plain and clearly taught in the Bible. Look at how we are handling marriage and divorce. Look at how we are handling it. Look at how we are handling sexuality. Look at how we are handling politics. And I think the church in Kenya is the good example. Look at how we have handled politics. Look at how we handle governance. And look at how we handle giving and tithing, what we are talking about today. Things that are so plain in scripture. But look at how we are handling them. And so when we look at the church today, we are replacing things that are so clear, clearly taught in the Bible, with actually probability. That uh, I think it was an Old Testament thing. I think times have changed. I think it's okay. Things that are clearly taught in the Bible. For those who are familiar with church history, you will realize that immediately after the Reformation, when you read church history immediately after the Reformation, you actually find no writing on giving and tithing. And you'll find the church theologians were concerned with serious doctrinal matters. For them, tithing and giving was something that was clear and plain in scripture that should be understood by everybody. It was clear. It was so clear. When you look at somebody like Martin Luther, his belief on giving was so simple. Ma Martin Luther believed that he's God who gives us wealth. And when God has given you wealth, he believed that you ought to give thanks to God and make sure that you, ha you make the right use of the wealth that God has given you. And for him, he believed that money is not a problem. The problem is the use of the money. And according to him, the more you earn, the more you are supposed to give. And that's how he believed. But the issue of giving and tithing started to gain attention in the 20th century when the word of faith movement started to come in with the prosperity gospel. And that's when people started to realize that something is going on in the church about giving and tithing that is not taught in scripture. Something has happened. And he started to gain attention because people realized that somebody somewhere is giving wrong teachings concerning giving and tithing just for selfish reasons. But why should it be that way? Why should it be that way? Why is it that things that are so clear and plain in scripture are not clear and plain to all Christians? Why is it like that? Is the Bible an, uh, an obscure book that cannot be understood? Is it? Now, the Bible is not an obscure book. It can be understood by everyone. In fact, the problem that we have in the church today as Christians is that we understand most of the things too well. We understand them too well. And the problem is actually just obedience. It's simply obedience. The scripture that we read, Malachi 3.10. When the Bible says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse of God. Uh, is it hard to understand? Is it calculus? Okay, I'm asking you the question. I, I expect an answer. Is it hard to understand? When he says, bring all the 
tithe into the storehouse of? Is it hard to understand? So we all understand that. So we all know that tithe means 10%. So we all know that. The problem is obedience. Let me give you a scripture. And you might think that. Look at Philippians 2.14. Philippians 2.14. Uh, in, in my church, when I mention a scripture, it pops up on the screen. So that's why I'm looking here. Can we all op open our Bibles and look at Philippians 2.14? Philippians 2.14. What does it say? Now, is anything difficult with that scripture? Huh? But how many times do we grumble and argue? How many times? So many times. So you realize... It is about obedience. And when God says, try me on this, he's telling you, can you just obey me once and see what I will do? Can you just obey me once and see? And when he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing, I think everything includes giving. Or it does not include it. It includes giving. And after all, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And so Paul says, do everything without arguing or grumbling. But look at what he says in verse 15 and 16. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in this warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Who doesn't want verse 15 in his life or her life? Every one of us, we want verse 15. But what about verse 14? What about verse 14? We all want verse 15. What about verse 14? So I think we don't have a problem with understanding Malachi 3.10. We have a problem of obeying Malachi 3.10. We don't have a problem with understanding scripture. As long as you can read it, you can understand it. We have a problem with obeying scripture. And when you look at the church today, you will see so many things, so many things that are so clearly taught in scripture, very plain, but we are doing the opposite. There are so many. There are so many things. But let us focus on, on tithing and giving. Now, 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 15. The Bible says, Thank you. All scripture is God breath. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, that scripture means what it says. When Paul says all scripture is God's breath and is useful, he means that. He means all scripture. When Paul was writing this to Timothy, the scripture that they had was the Old Testament. Just the scripture that they had. Now, when we look at this Bible, the scripture that we have today, we also have, we also have to try and understand how God revealed himself to man in history. 
it will help us to understand the concept of giving and tithing. Now, God revealed himself to man progressively until there was a fuller and a complete revelation of God to man in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom all through whom also he made the universe. So God revealed himself to Adam, but he did not reveal himself to Adam the way he revealed himself to Noah. Yes, he revealed himself to some extent to Adam and more to Noah than he, uh, he did to Adam. Then he spoke more fully to Abraham, revealing himself to him and even now giving Abraham his purposes for humanity. He revealed himself more supremely in the Old Testament through Moses and the prophets and progressively until he reached to Christ and we have a full revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, So the, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things through his power, powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so when we look at tithing and giving in the Bible, we also tend to see the same progression as how God revealed himself. Now, tithing in the Bible can only be understood and appreciated in their proper context, and especially in the context in which it is happening, in which it is being taught. One of the things we should stop doing as we look at tithing in the Bible is to interpret silence. And this is one of the mistakes that we do as a church, as Christians, when we read the Bible. We are quick to interpret silence instead of actually interpreting what has been written down. Now, I want to look at tithing, especially tithing, from three perspectives. Before the law was given, during the law, and after the law, we have to know that we today, we live after the law. Paul says that in Galatians, that we are no longer under the law and its curse. We are living after the law. But there was, before the law was given, there was tithing. Then there was tithing when the law was given. Then what does the Bible say about tithing after the law? Now, I, I, I hope we all know that tithing means 10%. Tithe means 10% of the annual produce or of what you earn. There are some countries where there is a state church. Uh, in those countries, uh, you actually don't give tithe to the church. It's taken by the government the way taxes are taken. So when you earn your salary, it is less than 10% tithe than other taxes. In that money, uh, because there's a state church, it's the, the state that pays the priests. So that's the money that is put together to build and develop churches and pay the workers of the church. In history, in, during the Babylonian times, tithe, tithe was used as a levy for the goods in transit. That when you're moving your goods from one place to another, they take 10% of that as a tax. Now, before the law, we have two examples of tithing. Abraham and Jacob. Of course, by that time, he's called Abraham in Genesis 14, verse 17 to 20. 
The Bible says, after Abram returned from def defeating Kedalaoma and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shave, that is the king's valley. And then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was, a, he was priest of God most high. And he blessed him, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered you from your hand. And verse 21 I think verse 21 says, and he gave him a tenth of everything. Now, so Abram gave a tenth to Melchizedek, the king of Salem. In Genesis chapter 28, the story of Jacob fleeing away from his brother Esau. He's on his way to Haram, Haran. Uh, then he reaches a place, it's at night, and he spends the night there. And in that night, he, ha he, he, sees a, he, he has a dream. And in verse 13, he says, the Bible says, There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out the west, and they will, and you will spread out to the west, and to the east, to the north, and to the south, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not, I will not leave you until I have done what I promise to you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Early next morning, Jacob took a stone and he placed, that took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Though the city used to be called Luz. Then Cha Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household and then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and all and of all that you will give me I will give you a tenth. That's Jacob speaking to God. Now from these two examples one thing is clear that Abraham and Jacob gave a tithe to God to God as a voluntary act of worship and devotion to God. No one forced them to give. It was voluntary. Now, I think one of the wrong things that we do with understanding that scripture, I don't think that we tithe because Abraham, our father of faith, did tithe. That's not the reason we tithe. Abraham was not se setting a presidency to be followed. If that is the case, or if we argue like that, we will actually mess up the Bible. Abraham and Jacob, they did it as a voluntary act of worship to God. That's when they gave the tithe. Now, Abraham was not setting a presidency. As much as Jacob, his descendants, also promised to tithe to God, he was doing it voluntarily. In fact, Jacob, it is a prayer. He is promising that God, if you will bless me, give me food, give me clothes to wear, of all that you will give to me, I'll give a tenth. He's making a prayer. And he's making a promise to God. So it's not that everything that Abraham did a Christian today is supposed to do. A good example is Abraham was polygamous. 
You cannot be polygamous and still claim to be a Christian. Let's look at tithing under the law. Now God comes and gives the law to the Israelites. The law was a comprehensive system of giving to God. And there were two forms of giving. There was giving that was mandatory that God commanded. You have to give. An example is the firstborn. It was mandatory. You have to give back to God. But there was voluntary giving. And now for the Israelites, their foundation was built on the law. And so tithes and offering were ingrained in their system the way for us taxes are today. So for them, it was a normal way of life. They will not complain about it because it was the law that governed them. And so the scripture that I read at the beginning gives the regulations on how the Israelites were to give tithes and also give other forms of giving to God. First, tithing under the law was a command. So there was no any other way around it. It was commanded. You have to give. Deuteronomy 14.22 Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Be sure to set aside. Then, the law also told them where they were how, where they were to give, what to do with the tithes, and where tithes were to be given. Tithes were to be eaten by the people giving. That's the law. And they were to be eaten at the temple. At the temple. And he gives a prescription to those Jews that were living very far away from the temple. What they were supposed to do, they were to sell the tithe where they were, then carry the money to the temple, then buy whatever that money will buy and eat it before the Lord. Of course, that practice was later on abused. And the abuse of that practice is what we see in the Old Testament Christ chasing away the man changers in, in the temple. It was the abuse of that practice. 20, Deuteronomy 14, 23 to 26. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, olive oil, the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of God, of the Lord your God, are the place he will choose as the dwelling place for his name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So the reason why they were to eat in the presence of the Lord is that so that they may learn why they were to learn that what we are eating, it is God that has provided. That's the reason of eating in the presence of the Lord. To learn that what they were eating, it is the Lord that has provided. But if that place is too distant and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink or anything you wish then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. But God adds another instructions. As they were supposed to eat their, their, their tithes before the Lord, we remember that among the sons of Jacob, they were the Levites. Levites were committed to the service of God in the temple. And because the Lord said, I am your allotment, he did not give them an allotment in the, among the Israelites. So as they were supposed, as they were to eat their, their tithes every year, 
they were supposed to remember the Levites, but they were not just the Levites alone. The poor, the fatherless, and the foreigners. So as the Israelites were eating their tithes every year, they were to remember the poor, the Levites, the fatherless, and the foreigners. And this is what the Bible says uh, in, Numbers, in Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. In verse 24, instead, I give to the Levites as their inheritance the tithes that the Israelites present as an offering to the Lord. That is why I said concerning them, they will have no inheritance among the Israelites. Now, this is how the Israelites were to eat their tithes. In the first year, they were to eat their tithes before the Lord. In the second year, they were to eat their tithes again before the Lord. But the third year, the tithe for the third year, it was to be given to the Levites as an offering. So they were to eat year one, year two, then year three, it was the tithes were for the Levites, the fatherless, the orphans, and the foreigners that were among them. Deuteronomy verse 14, 27. And do not neglect the Levites living in your towns, for they have no allotment or inheritance of their own. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your towns, so that the Levites who have no allotment of their own and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all in all the work of your hands. So that's how they were to eat their tithes. In Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, the Bible says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain, from the soil, fruit, from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever will redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth to of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. These are the commands the Lord gave Moses at Mount Sinai, Sinai for the Israelites. You realize God was so strict with tithing. So every tenth of is a produce of the field or from the herds was holy to the Lord. It was supposed to go to be eaten before the Lord. And if you are to make a substitute, you think, I think this is so nice. I can give another one. If you are to make a substitute, then you had to add a fifth of what was the tithe. And if, if are animals, you have herds, at the end of the year, they were supposed to go through the gate. Let's say this is where animals are kept and we are all living, you count one, two, three, up to nine. Number 10 belongs to God. Number 10 belongs to God. Now, if the Israelites were Kenyans like you and me, and number 10 is that fattened heifer, or that animal that you ju is just about to give birth, and you know that it's going to have a lot of milk. You'll be tempted to substitute it. It's no quelly. 
Okay, me I'll be tempted to substitute it. I don't know you. Now, what the Bible says, if you are, you are tempted to do that, that animal and what you thought that will be the substitute, they both belong to, to God. Are we getting it? They both belong to God. Uh, there are people who have done the mathematics and this, they keep on saying that the Israelites were supposed to give something like 22% in forms of tithes and offering. But I think we have to differentiate tithes and offering. Tithes were 10%. And every mention of tithe, the Bible is just speaking on one and the same thing. But now, we remember that every third year, the Israelites were to give their tithe to the Levites. Now, as much as the Levites were receiving, were receiving tithes from the Israelites on behalf of God, they were also required to tithe. So out of the tithes that they had received as their allotment from God, out of that, the Levites were also required to, to tithe. You realize that God was just requiring from the Levites exactly what he was requiring from the uh, ordinary Israelites. In Numbers chapter 18, verse 25, the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Levites and say to them, when you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as an inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as the Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as grain from the threshing floor or juice from the wine press. If in this way you will also present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites, from these tithes you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present as the Lord's offering the portion, uh, the Lord's, you must present as the Lord's portion the best and holiest part of everything given to you. So the Israelites were, the Levites were also uh, supposed to, to tithe. Uh, what about Malachi 3.10, the scripture that was read to us? Now, I think Malachi 3.10 has really been abused, and I think most of us, maybe we are aware of that. But let me focus on the context of Malachi 3.10. Malachi is a prophet who writes to the Israelites just after the exile. So he is post-exilic prophet. He is in the same company uh, like uh, prophets like, uh, like Obadiah, Haggai, and Zechariah they write after the exile, after they have returned from Babylon. Now, the context in which Malachi happens, Malachi 3.10 happens, when the Israelites returned to Jerusalem from exile, they again turned away from God. They again turned away from God. And they... Malachi 3.10, Malak Malachi as a whole, is a text to the Israelites, to a people who have actually failed to honor the covenant promises. And so, Malachi is actually calling the Israelites back to obedience to the covenant. And that's why, when you read Malachi as a whole, you realize he's condemning the corrupt priests He's against injustice in the society. He's against marriage breakdown. That's where we find God hates divorce. He's against discretion of the temple. People have neglected the, temp the covenant. And so he's calling them back to repentance so that they can return to God. And that's the context in which Malachi 3.10 
happens. I, I remember w one day I was in town and doing something, and uh, uh, I was supposed to pay. And uh, the amount that I was supposed to pay was amounting to 310. And uh, this guy, instead of telling me my bill is 310, he started to mention the name of a preacher in place of 310. Then I was like, oh God, that's how far we have fallen. You can imagine, if today you go to town and you just mention the name of a certain preacher, it will be taken off written. So that's the context in which Malachi 3.10 happens. So Malachi 3.10 is calling the Israelites, can we return back to the covenant that we set, God set with, we, we agreed with God? The covenant of giving a tenth back to God. Of honoring what God told us to do. So that's the context in which Malachi 3.10 happens. And Malachi 3.10 happens with a blessing, a promise of a blessing. Let us return to the covenant. Let us test and see. And God says, test me on this. Return to the covenant. Then you will see what I will do. If I will not open the storehouses of heaven so that will not even have room for the blessings that I will give you. That's the context in which Malachi 3.10 happens. And that's the reason why we tithe. To acknowledge the God that we have a covenant with. And tithing will bring you to a point where you acknowledge that God is sovereign of everything that you think you own. It's God that owns them. He says silver and gold are his. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. But they wait until you die, then you realize that, okay, you'll not be able to realize. Others will realize on your behalf. <laughs> Others will realize on your behalf that actually what you owned did not belong to you. What about the New Testament after the law? Now, most of the teachings of Jesus Christ are occasional, were occasioned by something. Christ did not sit down to prepare a sermon on the mount. It was occasioned. John 3.16 it was occasioned by Nicodemus going to Christ and asking him, how can I be born again? It was occasioned. Christ once he talks about tithing and it also in an occasion, an con a confrontation with the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So on the first value of that scripture, Christ has no problem with tithing. He only has a problem with selective obedience to the law. So he's telling them, let's obey the whole law. Paul, when we look at Paul, Paul, also his letters were occasioned by certain things. And Paul, he does not speak so much. Actually, he does not speak anything concerning tithing. He only speaks concerning giving. In fact, he's so elaborate with giving. Now, it will be wrong for us to assume that Paul's silence on tithing, he was against tithing. That is wrong. That is wrong biblical understanding. It's wrong. But it's fair for us to assume that tithing did not just present itself as an issue to the churches that Paul was writing to. 
we will always run into a problem with tithing when we make it legalistic. When we make it legalistic. But when we take it that it is an act of worship and devotion to God, it will always be a joy to tithe. So let, let me, in three minutes, let me just deal with the common questions that are normally asked about tithing. Where should I tithe? That's the question that people ask. I've several times been asked in the church, where should I tithe? The Israelites ate their tithe at the temple or where the Lord God had put his name. A place where they got their spiritual nourishment. And I think that is the place you should also tithe. You should tithe to the church that you worship at. So for you guys, you should be tithing to your own Christian union. For those who earn, should I tithe my net or gross? I normally look at it this way. Other people have different opinions, but personally I normally look at it this way. Part of your income is not your income. Taxes do not belong to you. Taxes belong to the government. So I think just do what the Bible says. You give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to I think the best question you should be asking yourself is how much of God's money do I still have with me? How much of God's money do I still have with me? And then you give yourself a honest answer and you give God his money. Should I tithe? Should, should tithe be always monetary form? No. The Israelites it was animals and what the land will produce. I think we give money because of, of convenience and in most cases we earn in terms of money. Should I tithe alone? I normally look at it as eating the seed and expecting the harvest. I don't, I don't think you're supposed to tithe alone. I can give a thanks offering on a loan. Should I tithe on a, a gift? That one you can debate on it. Should I tithe on a gift? Look at it this way. If I gave you a property worth a hundred million, it's not cash, it is a property. I don't think you have ten million to tithe. It's no quail. Or unless you sell the same property. So I think on a gift, I, I can give a thanksgiving offering. How often should I tithe? As often as you earn. So, friends, the church as an institution runs on the giving of Christians when we give offerings and tithe. And actually, that's how God designed his kingdom to work. The kingdom is supposed to be self-sufficient, sufficient, self-supporting. We are part of the kingdom and we give to the kingdom. That's how God designed the kingdom to work. But you'll be surprised that not many of us tithe. A study was done in the U.S., then it was discovered that only 5% of churchgoers tithe. Only 5% of churchgoers tithe. And actually, those people who tithe, they end up giving more than the 10%. And you'll be surprised that even in Kenya, we do the same. In my house, my wife and I, we normally set apart 10% of our income. And for years it has, we kept on increasing it, even if when our income was not increasing, to give us tithe to the church. And this is on top of the offerings that we give to church every Sunday, on top of the people that we support who are in ministry, that is aside. But a strict amount. One of the things that tithing and giving does to you, it teaches you to depend on God. It teaches you to depend on God. And it also actually liberates you from the love of money. It does. It's only that we are so selfish, we think that when we give, we will lack. But that is not the case. Giving will 
teach you to depend on God and liberate you from the love of money. That's what it does. So how I wish that we learned to give. And you don't need to have a lot to give. You just need to give what you have. You can only give what you have. May God help us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We bless your name. Thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus, you have spoken to us. We are so grateful. May this word change our perspective on giving and tithing, and especially in supporting the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord. Bless each one of us. Lord, meet us at our points of need, and more so teach us how to give as a form of worship to you. We thank you and we give glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.